Hello, this is ring announcer Thomas Triber, and you are watching Ring Walk UK Media. So hello and welcome uh, to the Ringwalk UK Media podcast. Uh, my name's Sean Rye. I'm joined by uh, MZ Boxing's Melissa Zad. And we're also joined by Luke, who is a special guest with us today over from our friends at Simbox. Welcome, Luke. Um, uh, thanks for having me. No problem. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the action from the weekend. We'll also look forward to the weekend's action coming up with uh, Canelo and Billy Joe Saunders. Uh, and probably everything in between. So with that, I'll hand over to Melissa, who's going to orchestrate proceedings for us. Thanks, guys. Um, really great to have you guys on. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so obviously, this Saturday just gone, we had quite a um, quite a good night of boxing. It was a match from show. It was the Shizora Parker undercard and main event. Um, and there was lots of quite exciting, quite talked about fights that took place on the night. So worth getting your opinions about what you thought of the different fights that took place. Um, so I'm just gonna throw some, some of the fights out there and then you guys can say how you felt about it, if you enjoyed watching it, et cetera. Um, so let's start with, I'm not gonna do it in any sort of chronological order. We're just gonna go off the cuff. I'm gonna start with my favorite fight of the night um, the fight of the night for me was 100% Katie Taylor v Natasha Jonas. I thought it was absolutely cracking fight. Um, be great to get your opinions. What did you make of it? Yeah, so for me, I think I have to agree that um, the fight of the night certainly was Katie Taylor, Natasha Jonas. I think that um, it promised to be the fight of the night and it really did deliver. It was razor close, as you can tell from the scorecards. Um, if there was one slight drawback for me, uh, as competitive as Natasha Jonas was, when the fight's that close, I would have loved to have seen her, you know, a little bit more upset maybe at the result, uh, you know, maybe arguing her corner a little bit more with Joe Gallagher. I think she she accepted the result, which is fair play, you know, uh, fair play to her for, for being, um, a, you know, a good loser, if you like. You know, I would have been a bit more sour in that in that respect and I would have been a bit more of a sore loser. Um I thought it was a very competitive fight and Tasha Jonas would have been well within her rights to believe she won that fight. So therefore, you know, make an argument about it and, and, and fight your case almost. But yeah, when, when the fight came to a conclusion, it all seemed a bit too friendly for my liking. Mm. Sean, what do you think of the results of the night? Did you feel that Katie Taylor did win that or did you feel that Natasha Jonas landed the cleaner, more eye-catching shots? It's an interesting one. I agree with what Luke says there, to be honest, that it was quite surprising how how well she took it, given that when she fought Harper and it was a very, very tight decision, she was visibly really upset. And, and, and they were they were similar fights. You, you could have been well within your rights to give it to Jonas. I think, although it's not the right way to do it, if you're the champion and you hold all the marbles, I think you really do have to wrestle it from them. And I know that isn't mm. fair. A decision is a decision. And if you win the fight, you win the fight. The thing for me that tipped in Katie's balance, maybe with the judges, was that the flurries that she was throwing. Now, I don't think for a minute any of them really troubled Jonas. And I think her defence was really good, as a lot of people have alluded to. But maybe that volume maybe just tipped in her favour. But like you say, was, was Jonas less unhappy because maybe she didn't think she'd get that close or maybe she didn't think she'd perform as well, well enough to take it. I don't know, but I think a lot of people thought it was going to be a tight fight and it was the best fight of the night for me. A hundred percent. I mean, I think that what you've just said, the point you just touched on with the volume output is really eye-catching for judges kind of looking at it. Katie Taylor still has that, she harbors that real amateur style of just like, you know, throwing a, mm -hmm. a, a amount of shots in one go and if you're kind of looking at it you can say that oh maybe that's the that successful um effective aggression 
Um, but from what I heard, because I spoke to a few people about it before the fight actually took place, and a lot of people um, were on kind of two sides of the fence, right? So you had the school of thought that was like, this is going to be a close fight. Um, I sat on that school um, and I was kind of like, this is going to be, this is going to be excellent to watch. Then a lot of other people felt that um, Natasha Jonas was going to be overwhelmed by Katie Taylor. And I think it's fair to say that she wasn't, and she really made such a great account of herself. And I'd love to see a rematch. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. I, I uh, in terms of the rematch, I think, sorry, go on, Luke. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, with, with the rematch, um, I get from that fight, for, for, in my opinion, that, um, you know, taking into consideration both ladies' age and experience, that it, it would never be that close again, unfortunately. You know, I'm a big fan of Natasha Jonas, but I do believe that, on that night, that was her perfect opportunity to, to defeat Katie Taylor. And I, I believe that any other fight moving forward would be a wider winning margin for Katie Taylor. Um, I believe mm -hmm. Natasha Jonas would be more favourable chasing a rematch with Terry Harper. Mm, interesting. Really interesting. Um, guys, so kind of moving on from that particular fight, talking about a few of the conversations that I had in the run-up. Obviously, when the running order came out, uh, it was there was a question mark. There was a question mark as to why a world title fight was going to take place before a second professional day, um, second professional fight of a um, you know a notorious boxer who's you know famous because of his uh, dad's accolades in the sport of boxing. What did you guys make of that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I must admit, I was surprised by the order for, for a number of reasons. If you're using a name to pull in the audience, surely you're trying to get some more numbers early on in the card because people tend to tune in sort of eight, eight o'clock and thereafter. And if mm -hmm. Campbell Latin is a big name, if not a big fighter yet, put him on earlier. And then the other thing with it is they talk about the pressure on the young man's shoulders and it must be really difficult. He's carrying the name, not only of his dad, but his uncle in his corner as well. So they talk about his family members. They talk about the history. They talk about Manchester. They talk about all these things, which is great. And then they put the lad right up the order and they're watching him under the telescope with, uh, under the microscope with loads of different critiques. And he's, he's fighting for the second time in his pro career. So I just think you're sort of setting him up to fail you, you're waiting for him to fall off that pedestal almost and then you on the flip side like you said you've got Dimitri Bibble who we haven't had the fortune of seeing over here in the UK before great fighter bona fide world champion potential for him to fight one of our other big light heavyweights in the UK by the way Craig Richards did a great job and he's on really early I just don't understand the logic in it I don't know what you feel about it Luke yeah, I mean, it's difficult because I can be quite biased with this because obviously I'm a proud Mancunian myself and I fully see where they're coming from with being at the Manchester Arena and Campbell Hatton making his Manchester Arena debut. It was the home of his father, Ricky, for so many years. But as you say, it's almost like they're setting him up to fail in a way here that it's only his second pro fight. And when I first seen the running order, I didn't, I didn't get the... The understanding, you know, that everybody was complaining almost that he's above some more high profile fights. And I, I took from it that he was almost like a four round float fight, you know, that if he was, a couple of the early fights went by knockout, you know, we expected Eubank to win by knockout, we maybe expected Bivol to win by knockout. And when those fights went the distance, there was kind of nowhere for Paul Hatton's fight to land. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, had this been, um, you know, attended by fans and it was a sold out Manchester Arena. You could kind of understand that they pushed him up the bill because you'd have a lot of his fans there, a lot of his dad's fans there. And it'd be the opposite of what you were saying, where you know you'd want him on early to bring in the audience on TV. But at the arena, you want those fights on later because it makes the audience stay a lot longer. Um, for me, I think he needs to be took out of the limelight. You know, we get mm -hmm. that he's got the surname, but you know, put him on undercards like Canelo Billy Joe Saunders this weekend in the fights that aren't televised, you know, let him take his next six, seven fights away from the glare of the of the cameras. And just build up his record because everything is under the microscope with Campbell Hatton. Um, it's difficult to feel sorry for him. You know, I don't really have sympathy for him, but I do believe that he, he could be took out the the limelight because when you're a boxer, you're always going to get some sort of attention, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. And I just believe he needs time to develop, to build his own character. And then when he's good enough, he'll step out of the shadow of his his dad. And if he's not good enough, you know, then it's a gamble that Matchroom have lost. Yeah, I mean, I think that. 
you know, you can't you can't blame the kid for kind of like taking the platform that's been given to him and using that opportunity. Uh, I think it's a lot of pressure for him. I mean, if I was in his position, I would definitely feel the pressure. Um, however, I, I totally agree. I think he needs to be taken out of the limelight. You know, he hasn't had this like great amateur pedigree. You know, he is very much learning on the job. And um, I think that these kind of things take time and perhaps putting him on quite late in on a matchroom event, you know, it's not going to help him learn without that sort of pressure. Um, but, you know, good luck to him. Um, really excited to see how he develops over the course of his boxing career. Um, so moving on to the Dimitri Bivol, uh, Craig Richards, light heavyweight contest. Um, I mean, I'm just gonna shoot in with my opinion on it. Um, and then I've got some questions that I kind of want to ask you both. But I think that it was an interesting fight to watch. I am, I'm a Craig Richards supporter myself. You know, he's London, London guy. Uh, I'm a Londoner. So of course I support Craig Richards. And I was, you know, really, really like um, hoping that he would do well. And I think he did do well. I think he performed really well. I think he gave a good account of himself in the ring. Um, I think that. I felt like he was a bit gun shy in the fight. I think he was a bit, quite, quite rightly, you know, Bivol is not a joke. He's a, he's a world-class operator. So I felt like he was a bit gun shy in the fight. And when it got to the later rounds, I would have quite liked to see him um, perhaps, you know, uh, let his shots go a little bit more. And in my opinion, I think the 19 month break that Bivol had before going into the ring um, might have attributed to the fact that I didn't feel he came out of first and second gear too much. Um, Luke, what's your opinions? Yeah, I think the, the the layoff that definitely played a big part in the performance from Dimitri Bivol. But as you say, there's levels for him to to go to and there's gears for him to break through. And there's a lot more to come from him. Uh, in terms of Craig Richards, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying in terms of the fact that you know, Craig Richards might not get a world title shot again. Um, he's criminally overlooked when it comes to the British rankings of light heavyweights. You know, we look at the likes of Anthony Yard, uh, Lyndon Arthur, Callum Johnson, Joshua Boatze. Let's not forget that Craig Richards holds the British title. So, you know, he needs a lot of respect for that. But he might not get near a British, uh, sorry, a world title again. And I think for me, I would have loved to have seen him leave it all in the ring. I wonder, you know, it'd be interesting to speak to him in the immediate aftermath and to see if he believes he could have done any more, you know, and if there's any regrets, you know, you kind of want to see a fighter throw the kitchen sink in that 12th round, you know, and just really go for it. And if they lose the fight on points, they can say, well, you know, I tried, but if they came out mm. there and was like, oh man, if I do a couple of extra right hands or if I put my foot down on the pedal at this point, you know, you don't want to get out of there and think, you know, I could have gone another couple of rounds. You want that 12th round to end and be like, you know, I've got nothing left. And that's what I kind of feel like with Craig Richards, mm. to be honest, with all due respect, of course. Mm, of course, yeah. And Sean, what did you make of the fight? Yeah, uh, alluding to what you guys have already said, but Craig Richards, let's not forget, I think he was, I'm right in saying he was even underdog for winning the British. He, he's, he's been underdog the last few fights he's had. And he, the layoff with Bivol, I think, is what is... Uh, what came across as like a, a not a poor first half of the fight, but he was quite tentative. And I was surprised how how much he sort of stood off Craig Richards, whether he was just having a look at him, feeling his way in, getting a bit of the ring rust off. But like you said, it was almost like an opportunity miss. And I think there'll be a few, of, again, with all due respect to Richards, some of those other guys that you mentioned, the likes of Callum Johnson, likes of Boatze, will probably be licking the lips and looking and thinking, well, I thought he was one of the stronger um, world champions and maybe they were looking at someone like Joel Smith Jr who's quite explosive they might now be looking at Bivol and licking the lips a little bit I'm not sure yeah but you know the flip side of that as well there I think that this win could age very well for for uh, Craig Richards you look at the cards and the, you know the reasonably close there's only a couple of rounds in it on a couple of the cards and I think if Bivol as we're saying between the three of us here is just shaking off the ring rust if mm. he goes and blows away his next couple of challenges all of a sudden we're looking back at this fight and thinking well, blimey, you know, Craig Richards took in the distance and he won a good few rounds. So it could be that Bivol isn't as good as we thought. Or likewise, it could be that he is in first or second gear and he's got a good few more gears to go through. And then all of a sudden we're looking back and thinking, you know what, Craig Richards done a, a fantastic job there in, in going the 12-round distance and being competitive. 
I agree. I mean, I think either way you look at it, it was a win-win for Craig Richards because, as you say, you know, he's the British champion. This was a world title shot. As everyone said, it was a step above um, his next, like, move. Um, and he stepped up to the plate and he um, he did well. You know, he came out of there. He landed some good shots. His defence was good. Um, and I think it helped that Bivol had had this time away from the ring and probably wanted some rounds in as well. Um, so I think either way, it was a good opportunity for Craig to also kind of maybe get an account of himself and find out where he is um, professionally. Mm-hmm. But anyway, moving on from that, uh, let's talk about the main event. Uh, I'm quite aware of time and stuff, so I'm not going to talk about every fight that was on the card that night. But let's talk about the main event, Tesoro v. Parker. There's been quite a lot of controversial opinions floating around uh, regarding the outcome of the fight. Um, Sean, what did you make of the result? The result, I was quite surprised really to see how many people were outraged, probably isn't the word, but surprised at the result. I mean, if if Delboy, he's been in, in the ring with enough top class operators to know that you really need to ram home that, that um, decision. And so he started pretty well. I don't think... I don't think it was that explosive. I thought there was a bit of a flash knockdown in the first round. He did okay first half of the fight. I was a bit underwhelmed by by both of them, if I'm honest. I don't think mm-hmm. you could. I, I don't think you can have too many outcries of robbery. It was it was close enough to not warrant that outcry one way or the other. I was surprised that Parker didn't um, come out a little bit more aggressive. I figured that with him being with Andy Lee, I, w- I was looking forward to a bit more of an uh, attacking intent. Typically, when he fights, he, he tends to do that. It's almost like he has the foot off the gas and then when he realises it's getting quite late, pours it on a little bit. I mean, I, th- I think he could have had White when he fought him, but he, he started too late in the day. Mm. I feel like he was a bit tentative of, of Del Boy's power again the other night and he, he edged home, but I wouldn't fancy any of them to make a dent in any of the, the big guys at the top. No, I agree with that. I mean, arguably... Um... Parker did step it up in the later rounds, you know, and that's when he was landing, in my opinion, the cleaner shots, kind of missing some of the swings that Del Boy was throwing out at him. Um, Luke, what did you make of the fight? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I'm going to completely disagree with Sean. Um, and I thought this was going to be quite an audio podcast, but yeah, um, <laughs> my opinion, totally uh, chalk and cheese with, with that. I think it, it, it wasn't... An outrageous robbery, you know, it's not going to rank up there with the likes of um, the Rung Vizar, not the Rung Vizar, sorry, the Chocolatito and Estrada fight earlier on this year, or of course the Canelo Golfkin one fight, which is constantly referenced. Um, but I just, I don't see how Joseph Parker has won that fight. I think you look at from round one, he was put down, and yes, it was a flash knockdown, but you, they all count the same. I give Chisora the first six rounds plus the knockdown, so that puts him seven rounds up. And he pinched one or two of the late rounds. So for me, there was no way he didn't win that fight. And if you look at Derek Chisora, he's 37 years of age. He's not really got any world title aspirations. He's in it for the big fights, the big paydays. And that's why you've seen his post-fight reaction was kind of like, give me the rematch because he knows the rematch will pay him well. Whereas Joseph Parker is a former world champion at 30 years of age, which is still young for a heavyweight. He he underwhelms time and time again. And there's always this this tag or this asterisk to his name of saying he's you know he's too nice and he is he's too, too gentlemanly he, he doesn't really seem nasty enough if that makes sense he doesn't go for the kill he doesn't put his foot down I think it was in the 12th round he had Chisora packed up uh, backed up to the ropes he landed a couple of good shots Chisora sagged into the ropes and Joseph Parker stepped off him naming mm-hmm. the heavyweight in the division that doesn't go for the kill there they smell blood and they go for the kill and I, I just, I don't know what it is with Joseph Parker. As Sean said, he takes rounds off and he comes on late, um, almost in desperation, it seems, because he knows he's let a couple of rounds go. And I don't know whether it's a mentality thing. I don't know whether working with Tyson Fury and Andy Lee, of course, will bear fruits the more that relationship progresses. But for me, I thought it was going to be a scrappy affair, but Joseph Parker's cleaner work would, would see him through. But it was just too, too far in between his good spells and the come forward pressure of Derek Chisora. And, the, you know, he, he was Derek Chisora. You know, you're not going to get the skills of Muhammad Ali or Lomachenko uh, or the fancy footwork from Derek mm. He's just going to keep coming forward. And 
Joseph Parkins just doesn't like it when they go and get tough. He almost feels sorry for himself. And that's what we've seen on Saturday. We've seen it with Dillian White. And yeah, for me, Chisora won this fight. It's not an outrageous robbery because it wasn't a lot of great work from Chisora, but he'd done enough for me to win that fight. Interesting. It's really interesting to hear both sides. You know, I, I have to agree with Sean on this one. I don't think it was that controversial win. Sorry, Vic. Uh, us ring walk lot. We stick together. Um, but, you know, what I will say is... Um, there's been a lot of talk recently in the boxing community community about scoring and judges and controversial scoring. Um, and I'd be quite inclined to pick your brains about what you think about that, because there's been quite big gaps in scorecards coming from different judges. Um, Sean, you go first. What do you make of controversial scoring and judging? It comes up time and time again, and it seems mm. to court controversy, whether... I actually spoke to an MC recently who I asked him how he felt when he when he gets the scorecards from the judges. And I said, do you ever sit there and score it and see it differently from ringside? And he said, all the time. And he has friends who are officials and stuff. And I think we need, I'm led to believe there's some articles out there that allude to it, but I think we need now some definitive, clear guidelines as to we can't keep saying in commentary or, or the guys on TV and broadcasting can't keep saying it's what you like because we don't understand what where the parameters are with that. So we, we understand that there's aggressive fighting. We understand cleaner work, cleaner shots, output, but we don't know how we don't know how it's scored with those in place. You know what I mean? So I don't I don't know what they're looking for, and everybody is so different. I mean what fight was it the other day? We had a swing from 120, 108 and 115, yeah. 113. How, mm. how is that the same fight and what, what is happening there? Mm. Absolutely. Luke, what do you make of uh, the judging scoring? Yeah, I kind of agree with, with Sean, which is nice, given that we uh, disagreed so heavily on Parker Chisora. <laughs> but I think the the whole, you know, it's what you like kind of thing could open literally Pandora's box because you start questioning then with home fighters, if they're a Chisora type, you know, come forward, not very fluid, not um, not likely to go on the back foot. Um, and if you get a judge that likes come forward pressure, then they're going to score the fight to that box. And then you start questioning, you know, where the promoter's going to get in a set uh, board of judges that are going to favour their fighters. And again, you know, I'm not, pointing fingers at Chisora and saying that, that was just an example, but it, it just kind of, it kind of opens the, the, the question, opens the door for, for controversy. And um, if, if it's what you like, but well, what do we all like between the three of us? We're all going to have different opinions on what we see as winning a round. And it's been going on for that long. And we've been questioning it for, for that long that it's bizarre that it's not been changed and it's not been altered. And to be quite honest with you, I don't know why we even start with, with sorting things out, people say about getting in ex pros and, and things like that, which is great to get the insight from those guys and their opinions. But at the same time, they're going to have their preferences. It's almost like there needs to be like a set rule of, of you know how to score a round because you can have a round that's extremely close with no knockdowns and it's 10 9. And then you can have another round that's quite wider with no knockdowns and it's still 10 9. So when people see outrageous scorecards and there's a wide mar winning margin for fighter A over fighter B but then you look back over the rounds and each round's close you're going to have fluctuating uh, scorecards because it can go to either guy if the rounds are close it can be scored either way so there's, there's a lot it's you know we'd like to sit here and put our finger on just one thing and say that's what needs changing and that's what's going to sort everything out but unfortunately it doesn't seem like it's going to be that simple yeah I mean I think this is the trouble with something that's so subjective right because I'm just thinking about amateur judging and like I judge amateur boxing and we can either have either three judges or five judges. And like this makes a difference anyway, because the five judge rule means that it sort of evens itself out anyway. You know, if people are sitting on different sides of the fence. But I'm just thinking back to the course that I took when I signed up for it. And it was kind of like they gave you very, very specific things to look for. And, you know, sitting in the judge's seat you kind of have to be aware of your own biases as well like oh I like that guy's uniform a little bit better than that guy's uniform and already you're kind of positively inclined towards that boxer so I don't know it's it's a really tricky one I think that I should just go in and sort it out but that's my opinion can I just say as well I think that 
we've talked about different formats and I think I think in the US they're trialing video knockdown things aren't they where they look back and check if it is a, a proper knockdown I don't know if we should mm. deviate right away from the format because I do think it prompts debate and I think sometimes we we don't want to be too sterile and we don't want to lose that talking point I know that's not great for fighters who who suffer results that they shouldn't get but we only need to look at sports like football where we've tried to move it on almost scientifically to make it better and it's, it seems to be ruining ruining the game so I do think mm. we don't need to deviate too much maybe just a bit more clarity and a bit more like you quite rightly said that there are courses and there are things out there that are telling you what to look for and what is scorable if you like mm. yeah I mean, we'll see because uh, obviously it's been a hot topic for a while. So we'll see how that one develops. Definitely one to keep an eye on. Um, anyway, guys, thank you so much for your opinions on the fight night uh, on the 1st of May. It was the 1st of May, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, appreciate that. I think I'll hand it over to Sean now so we can talk about the Canelo Billy Joe event. Yep. Okay. So obviously in the US this coming weekend, we've got a, a pretty decent card in Texas. I'm going to jump right in with the main event. We'll talk a little bit about bits and pieces on the undercard, but let's let's talk about the big one. Obviously, Canelo versus Billy Joe. Interestingly for me, I still really see both these fighters at middleweight, to be honest. I think that's where physically they're at their best. I think Billy Joe, the super middle suited him because he could be a bit... I'm not going to label a professional boxer as good as him lazy, but preparation sometimes doesn't go... His way, and I think he saw an opportunity at Super Middle to to get one of the main belts and fair play. So it's it, it's for, for for all the marbles at Super Middle or most of them. Um, it's difficult to make a case for Billy Joe Saunders, and and we've spoken before, or many people have spoken before about if someone is going to give him trouble, it would be someone with the style of Billy Joe Saunders. But you look at Canelo's resume and you, like to try and pick the bones out of that and look for a blueprint other than one of the greatest ever in Floyd Mayweather. You're really scratching around. He's not had too many other than obviously Golovkin contentious decisions. So even when it goes to points, he very rarely slips up. For me, I think the second half of the fight will be the most intriguing part of it. Um, and I'll ask your guys' opinion in a second, but I just think nicking rounds off Canelo is not disputable at all. I mean, even as bad as it, um, ended up Amir Khan's pinching rounds. I think Kavalev nicked rounds off him. So it's it's how he gets close when he's very cute at closing the distance. And I think at some point, uh, Billy Joe will have to give him something to think about to keep him off, to deter him coming forward a little bit. Um, how do you guys see it, Luke? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, first and foremost, we're, we're always going to support the Brit in, in Billy Joe Saunders and it'd be a, a huge upset if he was to go out there and get the victory um, unify three of the four uh, major titles and pick up the ring magazine title as well I think it ranks up there alongside uh, Lloyd Hunnigan uh, against Donald Curry I think it ranks up there alongside Tyson Fury beating Vladimir Klitschko if he goes in there and gets it done but we're looking at Canelo as pound for pound number one. You know, it's undisputable that he's, he's the best boxer on the planet at the minute. And he's as close to unbeatable, in my opinion, as we've seen in, in many a years. Maybe going back to a prime Floyd Mayweather in terms of, you know, if you want to get there and fight with him, he's, he's going to outman you, he's going to out muscle you, he's going to out punch you. If you want to go in there and have a shootout with him, um, he's, he's again, he's got the power to do that. And if you want to get in there and have a chess match with him, he'll have a match you with that or he'll knock you out of your rhythm. And... He'll make it his kind of fight. You know, you, you look at somebody like Callum Smith or Sergei Kovalev, those guys had physical attributes over him and he negated those. And again, he made it his kind of fight. Look at Callum Smith's left hand at the, the end of, of that fight, the grotesque swelling on the left bicep because Canelo didn't target the chest or the, or the, the midriff or the chin. He targeted specifically early on that left bicep, that left arm to take away the the catch and counter left hook from Callum Smith, which was his best weapon. Unfortunately for Billy Joe Saunders, I don't see in any which way he beats Canelo, even to the fact of the location of the fight. And we know in, in America, obviously it's not in Vegas, it's in uh, Dallas, Texas. So maybe, you know, he might get a fair shake there, but we know Canelo's already two or three rounds up on all three judges' scorecards. And for me, Canelo wins this fight and wins it conclusively, whether that be by a late stoppage or whether it be wide, you know, decision. 
I think you make a great point there, Luke, about um, the way that Canelo targets people. His defence is a, is a lot more cute than probably he was earlier on his, in his career. And even uh, his deception, some of his shots, you know, when he faints to the, the body with a hook and then he brings it up top. And there are lots of different ways he can get in close. And I think, I think Melissa alluded to it before when we spoke about it, that Billy Joe's got to keep his concentration because if he doesn't, Canelo's just waiting for that opportunity and he, it's very rare that he uh, bypasses that that chance. So Mel, uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I agree with you, Luke. I think that it's uh, undisputed that Canelo is, you know, I mean, he's just like the whole package really and more, isn't he? He's just like everything you want to see in a boxer. He's offensive, he's defensive, he's exciting. You know, he's a classy, classy operator. Um, and I don't think that there is a person out there that could beat him today. Um, I think that in a few years' time, that, you know, that might be the case. But as of today, as of, you know, next week uh, or this week, Saturday, I should say, uh, I don't think that Billy Joe Saunders is going to get the win. Um, I think that his style, you know, as you said, Sean, the fact that he's like a boxer, um, that is going to work in his favour 100%. But again, you know, he does have these moments that he switches off. You know, he has these moments where he loses focus, in my opinion. Um, and those those moments are going to be the moments that Canelo, you know, he monetizes on, essentially. Um, and I think that Canelo is going to come out of it successfully. And I think it's going to be a later round stoppage. Um, that's what I'm going to put money on anyway, when it comes to this Saturday. <laughs> okay. I think we can all three just agree not to tag Billy Joe Saunders in this podcast because we <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, it would be a really difficult um, ask. And I think great if he does it, but uh, very, very rare that you see the bookies with, with such a, um, a low price for someone like Canelo in a unification, but, but all the best to him. Moving on, uh, part of the undercard. Now, it's rare that we talk about a 2 0 boxer unless we're talking about Campbell Hatton. But I'm going to speak a little bit about um, a US talent that's on the same card called Keyshawn Davis. Um, his bout on Saturday is at lightweight. He's actually got his brother fighting on the same card as well. There was quite a big... I was surprised the Ferrari around him in his last performance. And I thought, oh, this guy's only just started his professional career until you look a bit further into it. Um, I think the guy... He fought in his second fight actually it was like 10 and 1 or something for a second mm -hmm. fight which is very very ballsy but then I guess they're not going to hang around with this guy because his pedigree at amateur level is fantastic and there's a lot of noise being made about him I mean I was just digging around and having a little look after uh, I'd seen his fight he's sort of the company he's keeping Chuckle Stevenson uh, Jamel Herring he was fighting for a while and spent a bit of time at May Mayweather's gym and I'm led to believe that both Mayweather and Eddie Hearn are looking at um, signing him up. I, I don't believe he's signed to a promotional outfit yet. I might be wrong, but he's definitely caught in a lot of attention. Um, uh, I did laugh when I looked at what Shakur Steven had put on, his, put on his Twitter and he'd put something like, Keyshawn is so special, we're finer, take over boxing together. Now, for all the old people out there like me, I have no idea, or I didn't have any idea what finer meant, but I've looked it up and apparently it means getting ready to do something. So you guys probably already knew that and I'm sure I'm source of humour, but <laughs> finer was a new one on me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this guy, by all accounts, is going to be the real deal. Uh, and the US, they're really producing at the moment, aren't they? They've, in, in most of the middle divisions, it seems they've just absolutely got a monopoly on it. Um, mm. Luke, first of all, what, what do you think of this guy? Have you heard much about him? Yeah, so Keyshawn Davis is a fantastic prospect. He's from Norfolk, Virginia, um, hails from the same town as Sweet Pea, Pernell Whitaker, one of the finest defensive boxers of all time, uh, rest in peace, champ. And uh, Keyshawn Davis uh, first came onto my radar a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months back. He was rumoured to be going to the Tokyo Olympics. That was obviously put back due to the current situation around the world. So he turned pro. He was almost a shoe-in to medal at those games. And 
he, as you said, there's a lot of promise behind him. I was lucky enough to interview him for Simbox uh, before his previous fight on the uh, Jamal Herron and Carl Frampton card. And he's a very confident young man. He's very brash and he's backing it up. As you say, he took on a guy that was 9-0 or 10-0 in his most previous fight. And he, you know, he battered him and took him out. Even when this guy tried uh, ruffling Keyshawn's feathers at the, the pre-fight weigh-in, you know, he's putting his hand in his face and stuff like that. And Keyshawn, he stayed very relaxed. And for a, a young man at 20, 21 years of age to kind of keep his composure and, you know, to, to do his talking in the ring, I thought was very fantastic of him to, to be able to do that. And he's been in with some top-level sparring. I spoke to him about sparring the likes of uh, Javante Davis, Shakur Stevenson, of course, who he's very close with, and Tiafimo Lopez. And he said, he, you know, he'd done well in those spars. He weren't one to scream from the rooftop, uh, the rooftop sorry, that he'd, he'd won those spars, but he said he was competitive throughout. And for me, he is, you know, a, a mega star in the making. He's got the style, he's got the appearance, he's got the swagger. And he'll be teaching uh, Sean a lot more about these American slang words moving forward, I guess. <laughs> Fair point. Um, Mel, as Luke pointed out there, he's very slick. He's got the swagger. He's got the platform almost already. He's, he's made for it. If you're promoting him, how difficult do you think it is to keep him grounded? Do you just keep putting him in with experienced guys or do you think you'd be tempted to escalate his, his progression? Yeah. Let me just let me just start by saying that is a fantastic question. I'm a big fan of that question. <laughs> <laughs> that is some fancy interviewing. I like it. Um, so I think that it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because as Luke pointed out, you know, he's quite young. And even in that kind of uh, face-off situation where someone's getting all up in his grill, trying to like draw him out, he wasn't, he didn't buy into it. And then he let his his abilities in the ring do the talking for him. And I you know, I don't know if I'm a bit of an amateur snob when it comes to boxing, but I feel like having that sort of amateur pedigree behind you is the thing that keeps you grounded. You know, this kid has obviously achieved such a great deal before he's even turned pro. So it's going to be a little bit harder to, you know, get him to sell out via the lights and the action, etc. cetera. Um, I think that if I was promoting him, which I would like to do, um, I think if I was promoting him, I would put him in there with people that are going to, you know, like the guy who was telling, you know, the background, Keyshawn Davis's background, they're gonna look at that and be like, whoa, this guy in his second pro fight, he's taken out this Ted and no guy. I would keep doing stuff like that, you know, because I think that's something that can happen with some of the American boxers is that because they're really confident and they have this like certain swagger and they talk themselves up, et cetera. A lot of people start talking about them like they're hype jobs, you know, excuse the, the slang. And I think that when you put him in tests like that and he comes out victorious and he doesn't get drawn into that kind of like, you know, tetchy playground business, I think that you can quite clearly see this guy's not a hype job. He's the real deal. Um, so that's how I would promote him. Yeah, just uh, touching on there before we move on with uh, Keyshawn as well. One of the things that I find like highly impressive about him as well is that, you know, for somebody as young as he is, um, he, he grew up in, you know, relative poverty and he's got his brothers along with him and they've, they've kind of made their own brand, if you like, with DB3 Enterprises. And to be that kind of switched on and that kind of business savvy already, you know, and he, he's getting out on, this is his second Canelo undercard. His other fight was on a world title undercard with uh, Frampton and Jamal Heron, as we already say. So he knows his worth already. And he's got his mum in his corner. She looks after a lot of his business acumen. And I think to have that kind of level headedness, as I say, you know, we look at people with all due respect, like Javante Davis, like Adrian Broner, uh, that are from the same kind of background as as Keyshawn. And we've seen that, yeah, they've gone on to achieve fantastic things, but their, their lifestyle out of the ring leaves a lot to be desired and we, we wonder where they will be in 10 or 20 years once their boxing career is done with. So to see somebody at 21, 22, as I say, with Keyshawn and have that kind of knowledge, that kind of wherewithal already is is superb, I think. And interestingly, when I did interview him as well, I mentioned about Ricky Hatton because uh, he, well, he mentioned Ricky Hatton said it's one of his favourite, all-time favourite UK fighters. I mentioned about Campbell Hatton fighting and he just made his debut. He asked what weight he, he was fighting at and said super featherweight. He said, that's oh, just below me. He said, I'll keep an eye on him. We don't know where that might go in the future. So that's a seed planted already for a, a mega fight in the five or 10 years. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great story. Um, just moving on 
to the some of the other fights on the undercard as well. We've got a bit more uh, Brit interest in there with Kieran Conway. He was due to fight uh, Jesse Vargas, which I think he was a bit upset. I think I think the fight that he's got lined up is a really good one, but the the name drop he would have had in Jesse Vargas, I think he was really looking forward to that. Yes, some might argue that Vargas was on the wane a little bit, but it would have been a great name on the resume. Mm-hmm. Um, as it is, he's got uh, Sulim- Suleiman Sissoko from France, who was unbeaten. I'm sure it'll provide a really stiff test. I just wondered what you guys thought about Kieran Conway in general, not just about the fight coming up, because he's in a pretty stacked division in terms of domestic fighters for us. I mean, you look at it, uh, the likes of Fitzgerald coming back now, hopefully he can make Super Welter again after his outing on Saturday. Uh, Cheeseman, Fowler, Shiraz, Williamson, Smith even. Where do you see um, Kieran Conway fitting into that mix? Do you, obviously, he's fought one of them before in Ted Cheeseman. Do you think he's in the in the top two or three uh, domestically? Melissa, you first. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, it's hard to say. As you say, it's quite a stacked division. Um, and I do think that you're right in saying that he was quite, you know, uh, gunning for that Vargas name on the resume. Um, and the fight that he's going to be taking part in, from what I've understood, is a bit of a step up for him. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that pans out. And I think that I'll have a better understanding of where he sits in the division domestically and otherwise um, following the fight on Saturday. Um, but you know, you never know. I mean, with these things, you just never know at the end of the day, like he can go in there and we're talking about it being a step up and he could just perform extremely well and actually make his, you know, solidify his, uh, his, his position. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the fight and seeing how it pans out. Okay. Um, same question to you, Luke. I think last time out Conway, I think McGowan took him a distance, didn't he? Do you, th- do you think he's got enough power in that division to, to trouble people? I think, as you rightly say, it's a very competitive division. Um, I think with Kieran Conway, I think he's criminally overlooked. Um, he's very underrated. He's only got one loss on his record, and that was to uh, Ozeza Ozeiz in the boxer tournaments. That was only over three rounds, which is unfortunate for him. He pushed Ted Cheeseman all the way when he jumped up in levels to take on Ted Cheeseman. He was almost like a, a comeback opponent for Ted Cheeseman after Cheeseman's fight with Sergio Garcia um, and Conway gave him a real fight. And I just think that this is a really interesting fight. I think it's quite bizarre that it's landed on a, a Canelo undercard out in, in Dallas, Texas, because this fight could have easily been on a, a UK undercard, given that the implications it has for the £154 division. I think there's question marks over Kieran Conway just because we've not seen him in enough competitive fights, if you like, and with Suleiman Sissoko. Uh, Sissoko was obviously managed by the same management company as Andy Joshua, so there's a lot of promise there with him. There's a lot of backing. Um, so I just think it's a really intriguing fight, and I think Conway, or the winner of this fight, puts themselves in a, a really good position moving forward for, for Sissoko. Maybe that's European title level, and for, for Conway, he'll be desperate to get in that British title mix because I, I do believe after the performance against Ted Cheeseman, he's never really been given that follow-up opportunity, if that makes sense. Yeah, great points from, from both of you. And one one thing I would say about Conway as well, technically he's really good, but also he's putting himself in the window and he's, he's taking fights, everything that's offered. I think the last fight, or one of his previous fights, he was on the AJ undercard, now he's on the Canelo undercard. So he's definitely giving himself a chance of exposure. And he's, I think there's a one of the versions of the world uh, belts on, on the line, I think an intercontinental one or something on Saturday. So again, good luck to him. Um, I think we'll finish maybe on just a little bit about learning about you two guys. And I'll have my input as well, uh, just to gain your guys' thoughts on your favourite fighters. For some of the guys out there that might have seen us on social media, I can see Melissa's thinking already about a response. <laughs> so I'll come to Luke. Luke, who are your favourite fighters growing up? And has that changed now? Have you got favourite fighters now? Yeah, definitely. So growing up, I'll be completely honest. This is, you know, it's quite interesting to think that I was a massive football fan growing up, and it was more so becoming alienated with the football game and you know the prima donnas, the the play acting, the the, the overpaid mad asses, if you like. You know, they don't deserve the money they're getting paid. But you know, fair play to them for getting that money. But it, it, it's it's almost a business now. It's not a sport. And I think for me, the the, the way I came away from football, I got more into to boxing so growing up I'll be completely honest and you know people like to sit back and say they love the likes of Tyson and Holyfield and Princeton's Eamon Joe Calzaga 
all great fighters. My introduction to boxing was ITV fight nights with the likes of Danny Williams, Michael Sprott, Aldi Harrison, um, and these guys were having round robins uh, tournaments for the for the British title and the Commonwealth title. And yeah, I, I love those fights. You know, the, looking back, they they kind of you know a couple of levels below what we watch now with Fury and Joshua, but highly competitive fights. And you'd have Michael Sprott knocking out Aldi Harrison one weekend, and then a couple of months later, Danny Williams would knock out Michael Sprott. But the more I got into boxing, I like following the journey of Anti Crawler. We went to the same school. Um, I, I speak to Anti Crawler on a, quite a personal level as well. So it was always good to watch him. It was difficult to be impartial with any of his fights. Um, but aside from that, you know, short and well, a long answer to a short question really is my favourite fight is Crawler. And currently it's Anthony Joshua and Canelo. You know, call me a filthy casual, but that's where we're at. No, I can relate to a lot of that, to be fair. And then and, and being a big, well, I say I'm a big football fan of Spot Middlesbrough, so, you know, but um, I, I, can relate to, yeah, I can relate <laughs> to that because the, I've fallen out of love with football massively because of lots of reasons, because I just feel isolated from it. I don't feel a part of that sport. And I don't know if that possibly, like I said, is the money or whatever it is. But I, I, another reason why I love boxing is the accessibility that we get as well. And I just, you, you, you feel part of the sport. And sometimes you pinch yourself and some of the guys you've mentioned there Luke you, you've spoken to them on a one-to-one -one and like how amazing is that and also when you mentioned this, about the round robin tournaments the prize fighters and stuff I do think that reignited boxing a little bit we sort of had boxing on terrestrial tv like ITV and stuff and then we sort of lost it it lost its way a little bit those prize fighter and and I don't know if it's Barry or Eddie that instigated them they probably both had a hand in it but it did mix it up a little bit. I mean, like some of the stories, like the Mongolian fighter, Choi, I think it was, who won one of them. And, and these obscure fighters who were just, it was like a slugfest and, and their way of getting their name in the in the, in the the lights. But growing up, I, I loved the flamboyant fighters. I loved Eubank. Most people between Eubank and Ben were team Ben. I loved Eubank. I loved Naz. I loved that attitude. As I've grown up, I, I probably prefer the, the offensive fighters the likes of Amir Khan and, and Kalzaghi, as you alluded to as well. I love the attacking fighters. So I guess, Melissa, your, your turn to tell us who you admire. Um, well, it's a really interesting one for me because I didn't watch boxing growing up, you know. It wasn't the sport that I was into. Um, I was quite keen on tennis. But um, I don't know, I'd say about five years ago, six, maybe six, seven years ago, I... Uh, was actually dating somebody who was a boxing fan and I used to watch boxing and I didn't really understand the technicalities of it so I used to watch people like Carl Froch and I was like oh yeah you know he just walks forward and like he's just quite ruthless and I appreciated that element um, but then as I picked up a pair of boxing gloves myself I started to understand the work that goes in and I remember the first time I saw Lomachenko and he was fighting um, Rigo and I was watching the fight and I was like, oh my goodness, this is magic. This is actually sorcery. This guy is floating in the ring. And I was an immediate fan of his um, to this day, very heartbroken about the Lopez situation. Um, and then, you know, as I've kind of gone into the sport of boxing more, you know, I really appreciate the likes of Terence Crawford. I really appreciate Canelo's just all round ability. Um, these are kind of the active fighters. But I think right at the start, when I was first getting into boxing, I was watching, you know, Pacquiao, Cotto, these kind of fights. And those, that explosive style um, was what really drew me into the sport. But yeah, there's just too many boxers to name. I, I kind of appreciate a lot of them for different reasons. 100%. Uh, well, I don't think I've got anything more to add. I've really enjoyed um, chewing the fat, as it were, about last weekend and this this coming weekend. Luke, on behalf of Ringwalk UK Media, thanks ever so much for joining us. It's been uh, cracking to have such a knowledgeable guest, um, even if you did disagree with me. We, we made it up in the end, so I'll forgive it. <laughs> Melissa, have you got anything else to add? Very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing to add from me. Thank you so much, both of you. It's been a really great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Great stuff. Thank you ever so much. And yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, ditto. Thank you ever so much. Okay, guys. Take care.